If uh, Cassidy, you can throw up my first slide. I hope that came through. There we go. And that we're going to be talking about the power of denial today. And, um, you know, as we talk about that, we have come into 2019, we've come into a new year, we've come into a time where people constantly make resolutions. Anybody here make a resolution this year? Good. Good. People make resolutions, you know, and, uh, you know, what's the resolution you might say? Can you turn to my next PowerPoint? What exactly is a New Year's resolution, the dog asks? It's a to-do list for the first week of January, right? Because that's all it lasts. It's, you know, they're worthless. And um, here actually is a good list that we maybe would want to consider for resolutions. To have a healthier diet. I mean, that's a good thing, is it not? To travel more often. Yes, amen to that. To read at least one book. Two books, three books this year. To recycle more than you throw away. To spend more time outside. To spend more time with people that you love. To embrace your spirituality by prayer and fasting. To have a more positive outlook. To improve your grades. To give thanks for at least one thing every day. To stick to a budget. To stick to a healthy sleep schedule, to stress less, to exercise more, to learn at least one new thing every day, and to achieve each and every goal that you can. That's a good list, right? Those are, those are very positive things to add to your life, not as a New Year's resolution necessarily, but for every day of your life. Then again, there's more of a young adult-ish, teen-ish idea of New Year's resolutions, and that would be this. Skip more classes in school. Call in sick, as work, uh, sick at work more. Go shopping more. Now, I didn't make these. I just pulled these off the net, so I, don't blame me for the spelling mistakes. Uh, go shopping more. Uh, eat more junk food. Uh, have more soda and less fruit juices. And less exercise and more TV. All the young adults say amen to that, right? And... Um, Flip to the next slide. My goal for 2019 is to accomplish the goals of 2018, which I should have done in 2017 because I promised them in 2015 and planned them in 2014. I mean, sound familiar? The next one says, I'm still working on my tablet here as I'm going through. Oh, these are some great resolutions that I found online. Some people, this was their never, never again will I take sleeping pills and laxatives on the same night. My resolution is to get back to my fat weight the first time that I thought I was fat. My resolution is to exercise. Exercise my right to eat. My resolution is to pace myself and not go to the gym on days ending with why. Think about that. My resolution is to spend less time interacting with people and more time with my beloved phone. I'm doing pretty good so far. What's the next one? Ah, oh, yeah, this is the last one. My New Year's resolution is to not make any New Year's resolutions. And now that I have broken it, I'm all done with resolutions this year. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm almost maybe there. I think I have found it. Yes, victory, victory in Jesus. That was really weird. All right. Today we're going to begin with our week of prayer and fasting. And I want to talk to you about the power of denial. The power of denial. And uh, let's just begin with prayer. Lord, I thank you that my tablet is working. And I thank you for every person here this morning that we might hear from you. Speak to our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, our week of prayer and fasting is all about denying ourselves food and denying other things uh, like the cell phone and stuff like that. And, you know, that might sound very much like New Year's resolutions, but it's not. A week of prayer and fasting, uh, going without food or going without other stuff, you know, number one, why would we even want to do that? 
You know, there are people starving all around the world, not by choice, and we choose to starve ourselves for a week. Why would we do that? Why would we starve on purpose? No food all week. Skipping lunches, Facebook, cell cell phones. Uh, Why would we do that? Well, everyone around us embraces doing what they want, embraces eating what they want, enjoying what they want, spending how they want, living how they want, and just enjoying whatever they want. And you, pastor, you say you want us to deny ourselves for this week. Well, my answer to that is yes, I do. I want to call you to deny yourself this week. Not just this week. It's a lifestyle. But it's not me calling you to that. It's Jesus calling you to that. Jesus says, if you're my disciple, these are the things I'm calling you to, to deny yourself. Uh, One of the things Jesus said about fasting was, he he didn't say, hey, Christians, if you fast, he said, when you fast. It, is, it, it was a regular part of their lives, and it needs to be a regular part of our lives. But before we jump into that, I want to just kind of look at the outcome and purpose of fasting. And John 10.10 10 on the board there says this, I have come that may, they may have life and have it to the full. And, and Jesus wants us to have the best life possible. He wants us to enjoy life to the fullest. He wants us to be successful, to have joy, to have excitement, to have God's blessings. And it doesn't come by indulging in all those things that everybody else indulges in. Do you know that even this world understands what it means to deny itself? This world has a type of success standards that they go by and and successful people in the world's mind understand denying themselves things every year um, here at the church actually not at the church but someone's home usually on the first Sunday of February we have our our uh, Super Bowl Super Bowl party and this year it's Super Bowl 53 and how many watch the Super Bowl thing on the first week of February okay two of you good how many hate football, including me. Okay, good, good. Anyways, so we have the Super Bowl party, and and, it's a great time. It's just a reason for us as Christians to get together and enjoy one another. I think we usually have one person watching the game while everybody else is playing games and having food and talking and stuff like that, and it's it's fun. But we we also do, in that time, uh, we have prizes. We have prizes for the, you know, who's closest to the halftime score and who's closest to the end score and whose team won and all that kind of stuff, and so we have prizes for that. And then we, at the halftime show, we, we, we sit there mocking and laughing, uh, you know, whoever is doing their thing, and it's a little crazy out there in the commercials and all that kind of stuff. And um, this year, if you didn't know, uh, Maroon 5 is going to be doing the halftime show. Does anybody know who Maroon 5 is? Do you? I had no idea. I never heard of them, <laughs> right? So anyways, Maroon 5. And um, anyways, so we were thinking this year... We have the Watoto Choir on February 3rd. The Watoto Choir is going to be uh, doing our Sunday morning service. So um, Debbie Lynn is going to be calling some of you guys and saying, hey, could you billet some of these kids? There's usually about 30 uh, kids and adults to, uh, to billet out. And uh, you give them breakfast in the morning. You, and then, then the next day on the Sunday, Right after the service, after they do their whole thing, at about 12.30, we're going to have a potluck. So I'm, right now I'm inviting all of you to stay for the food, stay for the potluck. Not only stay for it, but bring something, because we need you to help us feed these 30 extra people. Anyways, but after that, then we're thinking, what? You know, it's been a long weekend already. Maybe we should just scrap the Super Bowl party, because... You know, who wants to host it after all the busy weekend? And so if you are thinking, hey, you would love to host this little gathering, come talk to me. And otherwise, we're probably just going to do a, a coffee at a and at 6 o'clock. That's our default, just getting together. So anyways, my point is not about that. My point is when it comes to, when it comes to the Super Bowl and winning a game, the things that we don't see. I mean, we see all the fun and festivities around it, 
We see our favorite players. We see how the team works. We, we see all this great stuff. that they, It's worthy of TV, right? And, and we see all that. But what we don't see is how much the players have to deny themselves so that they deny themselves before and during the season because they want to get to the prize at the end. They want to win the Super Bowl. And they deny themselves. The world understands doing that. They give up relationship time with their family or girlfriends or whoever. They give up junk food. They give up special, they have special diets. They exercise, they train, they practice, they learn together as a team. They study their opponents. They, they figure out ways to make themselves a team, to work as a team. And then in the end, to hopefully win the prize. They deny themselves for the greater good in their lives. They deny themselves to achieve their goals and to achieve the team's goals. Doesn't that kind of sound like the Christian life? Together, we could prayer and fasting, we deny ourselves together. Not just to be separate, but to be a team together, working together, seeing the kingdom of God connect with Vernon through us. Thank you. The world knows how to deny themselves. And, and even, you know, with the whole thing of New Year's resolutions, it says it over and over and over. They know what it means to deny themselves, yet most people don't do it. A Christian has similar reasons to deny themselves. But instead of our own glory at the end, we do it for the glory of God. We do it so that he is honored. Throughout the Bible, we see all these different people denying themselves. And they deny themselves so that they can have a closer relationship with God. Adam and Eve, God commanded them, said, do not eat of this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat of that tree. And so they had to deny themselves, deny themselves, deny themselves until one day they didn't. And you know what happened with that? Their relationship with God was strained, was hurt. David, called by God to be king, but even when the current king, King Saul, was trying to kill David, David restrained himself and denied himself justice and would not lift his hand against the the, the reigning king, which he could have easily, he was delivered into, into David's hands over and over. Abraham, Abraham and Isaac, Abraham was called by God to have a relationship with him. And along with that relationship, God promised him that he would be a great nation through his offspring. And the next thing that we see is God asks him to take his first offspring and sacrifice Isaac on the altar. And so Abraham, going through this vexing thing, (sighs) God, it's through my offspring that you're going to make me a great nation and you're, you're requiring me to give up my son. And then you know the story, how the story goes, and God provides the lamb, just like he does in providing us a lamb in Jesus Christ to die for our sins. That's Abraham and Isaac. How about the Old Testament Nazarite vow. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of that before. Samson was one that, that had the Nazarite vow, and, and Samson was born for a special purpose, to be the deliverer of Israel from the Philistines. And an angel came and told Samson's parents, said, look, you've been barren, I'm going to give you a son, and you know, he's going to be called Samson, and he is going to be a Nazarite. He's going to do the vow. And he's going to be that Nazarite even in the womb before he's born. And so, Mom, I want you to do those things of the Nazarite vow while you're pregnant. And so she had to do that. And so as a Nazarite vow, they could not drink fermented drink. They could not uh, eat unclean food, which is a thing that the Jews, if you know about the Jews, um, you'll know about that. And they could not take a razor to their head. And so denying oneself, I mean, it's all over the Old Testament. It's all over the New Testament. Elisha in the Old Testament uh, had to leave his family 
and his inheritance and give up the farm and the regular life and jump into ministry, jump into being trained by the prophet Elijah, he had to deny himself greatly. The point is that with all these denials, all the, there's many, many great and wondrous things that come into our lives, that transform our lives, that, that God meets with us in special ways. The denials brings a power that Christians need to have. And so if we're not fasting on a regular basis, that's something that each one of us needs to consider. Millions of people in the Old Testament, all the Jews, God gave them this strict diet, a way of living. They had to deny themselves so much to honor God. Some of them are major heroes of the Bible. Most of them are unnamed, but they did it too. They would deny themselves to strengthen their relationship with God. How much this morning, church, are we willing to deny ourselves to have a better relationship with God? How much would you deny yourself? Would you, would you deny yourself junk food for a week? Jesus says something very profound about what it means to him for us to have life and have it to the full. Let me say that again. Jesus says something very profound about what it means to him for us to have life and have it to the full. For us to have the most exciting Christian walk we can have. Jesus in this point of ministry that he's at, we're going to see a verse in a second. Jesus, in this point of ministry, he comes to his disciples. He's done all these miracles. He's preached to all the people. And now it's coming down to the crux of why he is on this earth. And he says to his disciples, who do people say that I am? Some say John the Baptist. Some say I'm this prophet. Some say this and that. And then he asks the real question. He goes to where he's getting to, and he says... Who do you say that I am? And he's asking his disciples that are around him, who do you say that I am? And Peter kind of stands up for the rest of the group and he says, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. What a, what a profound thing. It, like Jesus says in another passage that it, it wasn't his own brain that came up with that, that, that God had touched his heart already. Jesus says a very profound thing in Luke chapter 9, verse 21. If you want to put that up. It says in verse 21, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed on the third day, be raised to life. That's a profound thing in itself, right? It's profound for him that he's going to go to his death He's going to be beaten and bruised. He's, um, it's just going to be awful. It's a profound thing for him, and he knows it's coming. It's a profound thing for us because if it wasn't for that, we would not have a relationship with God. We would not have salvation. So that's profound, but even more profound, not that anything can be more profound than that, more profound for us is our response to what he did for us. Verse 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Wow. Like what a statement. Jesus is calling us to be just like him. As he knew he was going to the cross and death and 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 to be a light for the world, he's calling us to a similar thing. He's calling us to live for God and to live for others over ourselves. He's saying, deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. Live as though you are dead to yourself and you're living purposely for God. He calls us to live like we were baptized. How many here have been baptized in water? Okay, And he's, he's calling us to live like we're baptized. That when you get baptized, you go under the water, representing that we die to ourselves. And then when you come back out of the water, to new life. 
You are reborn. You are a new person. And he's calling us to live like that. To deny ourselves. Have you ever been accused of something that you didn't do? Been accused? I think all of us probably have been, right? If someone accused you of something really, really bad... You don't just deny the the accusations that are being thrown at you. You vehemently deny the accusations, right? Someone says, you did this horrific thing, and you say, hey, I didn't do that. It wasn't me. And we get passionate about it. And you know, we should get passionate about it, especially if we're innocent, but then again, I was just now thinking that, you know, lots of people that aren't innocent, they get very passionate about denying that they did it too, right? But we get passionate to deny that we did something like that. You know, when I was living up in Terrace, I was between churches. I pastored in Terrace for a bunch of years, waiting on the next church, between churches. I uh, got a job. I was driving bus. And while I was driving bus, um, I had this four, grade four girl on my bus that was a rotter. Um, she was awful. Just awful. We had, every day I had a packed bus. And she, when she would get on at this elementary school, and then we would get, get senior high students on after that, she would get on one of the first ones. And as everybody would be coming on the bus, she would be tripping them, and she would, be, she would even spit at them, or she would uh, call them names, or she would you know, do all these crazy things. And, and she, she pestered and mouthed off and tripped. And, and uh, you know, I had asked her as the bus driver to stop over and over, and I'm going to call your mom, I'm going to, you know, do all this and that, and nothing worked until finally I had enough, and I had to go to my protocol, and my protocol was when someone is that disruptive, you take them back to their school, or what I found out later on was you could take them to any school, but her school was close, and uh, took her back to that school with a whole busload of kids. And everybody was cheering. They were, they, all the bus was thrilled that I was doing that and kicking her off. And, right? and um, anyways, and so I radioed my dispatcher, and he called the school, and, and, and he said, make sure you get your principal out there when the bus arrives. And yeah, everything was good, you know. And, and so the bus arrives at her school, and there's no principal to be seen outside. I have 30-some kids in the bus, and I can't just leave the bus, right? Um, So I'm waiting and waiting, and nobody comes out. There's no principal coming out. There is no teacher coming out. There is no secretary of the school coming out. Nobody's coming out to help. We're stuck. And so I thought, well, I've got to handle this. So I I tell the girl, come on with me. We're going to go into the school. We're going to see the secretary there, and Nope, I'm not going, right? Very defiant, and nope, she won't. Starts freaking out. So I walk over to her seat, and, and you know, I can't, you can't grab their arm and pull them out, so I figure if I grab her knapsack, so you had it on her lap, so I grab her knapsack, and she starts really freaking out. Starts yelling, he grabbed me. Starts yelling abuse. Grade four knows about this kind of stuff, right? It's sad, but starts yelling that I had done something. And, you know, there was nothing that could be even remotely interpreted that way that I had done something. But that was her defense mechanism to start calling that out. Well, as you would figure, the world stopped for that bus right then. Um, the principal came out, the teachers finally came out, my boss drove over, had police cars there, um, I think there was a counselor that came, the irate mother came, oh, it was a zoo, we, uh, we got everybody off the bus, and the girl wouldn't get off the bus, the police couldn't get her off the bus, the principal, the counselor, no one could get her off the bus, and uh, anyways, I was being accused of sexual abuse. The whole bus was being held hostage for over an hour there. They were all witnesses, right? They were all offloaded on the bus. They were all witnesses to what may or may not have happened. And so no one could leave until the police had interviewed every person. And so um, they did that. And every one of them backed me up. Every one of them 
exonerated me. Everyone uh, told how I was innocent, how this didn't even happen. The ones that were right around, they had a first-person view and could say, you know, nothing close to any of that. So I was exonerated. But you know how injustices go. Um, Because the mother made a big stink, this grade four girl didn't have to apologize. This grade four girl was allowed on the bus the next day. This grade four girl got her way completely. And all along, with those claims of abuse, I was vehemently denying her accusations. And the witnesses were vehemently denying those accusations too. You know, my job was on the line, my, my reputation, my next church, uh, my Christian witness, my life. The truth was on the line, and it needed to be told. And my whole life depended on the truth being told. Do you know that I was the one that was kicked off the bus? I'm the bus driver, and I got kicked off. I got put on another bus route. I'm innocent, but because there's conflict, I was put on another route. And so, yeah, the girl got her way. In the same way, the things that Jesus calls us to deny, if we're going to deny things, we need to do it vehemently. We need to do it with passion and purpose. If we are going to take this week of prayer and fasting, we can't just do it flimsy, half-hearted, maybe. I haven't thought about it. We need to jump in and, and, and do it like we love Jesus, right? Some of the things that we're called to passionately deny. We're called to deny ourselves. I think it's on the board here. Coming up. There we go. To deny ourselves and conform to his image, Romans 8. We are to walk as Jesus walked. We are to lay aside every weight that hinders. We are to not live for self, but instead live for God. We are to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We are to let Jesus become greater and we must become less. We are to figure out where our treasure really is. We are to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. We are not to serve two masters. We are to give up everything for Jesus. We are to make our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. We are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. There's lots of things that God calls us to deny in this walk with Christ. And you know, you go through a list like that and you say, oh my goodness, pastor, the Christian walk is the hardest thing to do. And it can look like that if you, if you look at it at a certain way. If you see a bunch of do's and don'ts and rules. But if you see a love relationship, like a marriage or a boyfriend-girlfriend, if you see a love relationship, we deny ourselves many times in those relationships. We sacrifice a lot in those relationships. Why would we not sacrifice for the one that we love so much that for God that he gave his only son to die on a cross for us? If I asked you right now the question, who is Jesus to you? Who would you say? What would you say? I'm not going to have you turn to one another, but if you told someone right now beside you who, who Jesus was to you, what would you tell them? Would you say, hey, he's the man upstairs You know, when I'm in trouble, I call out. Or Would you say that he's some holy man or he's a good teacher? Maybe you'd say that he was a guy that lived 2,000 years ago that had some really good teachings. Maybe the same as Peter, you might say he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He's the one that forgives my sins. You might say that he is your Lord or he is my Savior or he's everything to me, but turning it to you, what would you say to the person next to you about who Jesus is to you? If he is our Lord and Savior, Luke chapter 9 tells us how to be his follower. Can you turn back to that verse 923? 
There it is. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross daily and follow me. He tells us what we need to do to be his disciple. And to deny ourselves means to say no to ourself and yes to God. To humbly submit my will to God's will. And you know, we've repeated this many, many, many times. In fact, for, for, for thousands of years, Christians have prayed this prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer that your will be done. Not my will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's denying ourselves is to become like Jesus that this week when you go out to work or to school or, or you come to the evening services and something, someone says something rotten to you because they're fasting and they're cranky and you take it personally, um, when someone hurts you or badmouths you or wrongs you, Jesus calls us to deny ourselves and turn the other cheek. He calls us to forgive one another. And, and more than that, he says, and do good to one another. Like when they do something against you, do good to them. Like that's not what the world teaches, but that is who our Lord is. And he, he lived that out. You know, it's tough to deny ourselves. It's tough. Will we always be successful in every situation? No. In fact, we're going to mess up so many times, it's not funny. But there's always the words, sir or ma'am, I'm sorry. I messed up. Humbling ourselves, denying our pride, and apologizing. Life's a journey. We're not going to always do it right. We learn as we submit ourselves to God's will. The power of denial it's a deeper, closer walk with God. It's more than that, though. It's many things more than that. But one other point I have here is that it's training so that we will not be carried away by every wind that blows. We're not carried away by, by every fad that happens. It's training to say, I know how to say no. That's what denial means, to say no. I know how to say no when temptation comes because I know how to fast. It has taught me something. I know how to say no when people want me to go out and do this with them. I know how to say no. It's just like fasting. It's denying myself. Why would we live a life of denial? It's actually for a wonderful reason. It's because we have been forgiven. Because Jesus died on the cross. He died to pay for our sins that we might have this life and have it abundantly, right? We live a life of denial because we've been forgiven. We live a life of denial because when Jesus Christ, when you invite him into your life, he comes in and his Holy Spirit does things in us amazing things to make us like Jesus. And so there... Are, we are changed. We're changed people. When Jesus comes in, we're changed. And when you say the word denial, you think, I need to do this. Where if you're not a Christian and you think the word denial, you're thinking, I don't want to do this. I want to take on everything I can and do everything I can and spend everything I can. And, and as a Christian, you say, no, I'm a follower of Christ. I love to do this. I love to deny myself so that I can have a greater relationship with my God. As disciples, we have new longings in our heart. We have new desires in our heart. We want to serve and please Jesus. As a disciple, we want to do his will and not our will. I want to call our worship team to come. If you could begin to play. You know, as we think about denying ourselves, you think, Pastor Cliff, that, that, was, that was a lot to think about. It sounds like, oh, giving up so much stuff. And it's, you know, it's really not that. 
if you understand it in the love relationship sense. And you might say, Pastor, how do I start? How, how do I start a life of growing closer to God through denial? Well, two things. Uh, one thing, two things we're going to do today. The first one is we're going to go into a time of communion this morning. And uh, as we receive communion, the cup and the bread, it's, it's for every Christian, every person that's bowed a knee to Jesus Christ. It's for everyone that says, I am a disciple of Jesus. This small meal, the cup and the bread are for you. For, uh, if, you're, if you haven't given your heart to the Lord yet this morning, then I would say to abstain, yet I will give you a, mo- a chance to invite Jesus Christ to come in. I'd love to have you have this meal with us. And... So we're going to take communion, but communion is a time where we as Christians examine ourselves. And we examine ourselves for the purpose of denying ourselves, saying no to the sins that we have maybe embraced over the past week or month or year or whatever. And so we start denying with communion by examining ourselves and submitting ourselves to God and asking him to reveal to us sins that we need to get rid of so that we can have this right relationship with him. The second way that we can begin, take this week of prayer and fasting. And we can begin as a church together to choose to take the first week of the year to focus on our relationship with God to deny ourselves a meal or two, to, do, to come to evening meetings, to, to hear God speak into our lives. The theme again is listening prayer. In fact, during the week of prayer and fasting, we're going to hear five different people talk about how they first heard from God. When God kind of first started speaking to them that they recognized his voice. As we come to these evening meetings, it's a time to shed off those old things, those things that Christ calls us to deny, to start shedding some of those off and to repent. The week of prayer and fasting, actually the Christian life, the denial, it's resetting our hearts. You ever reset your computer? It's it's resetting our hearts to start the year off right. I want to invite our our communion team to come up and we're going to receive communion this morning. And um, just before I do that though, this morning you might say, hey pastor, I want the juice. I want to drink the juice. I want the bread. I didn't. I'm just having some fun. Um, Our juice isn't spiked. Our juice doesn't have anything in it. The juice represents the blood of Christ. And the bread represents his body. And Jesus calls us when he died on the cross and he rose again. He called us to do this regularly to remember him. Right? And, And when he says to remember him, it's to remember those things that he taught. that The denying of ourselves. Things like that. And so this morning, if maybe you haven't bowed your knee to the Lord, you haven't invited him in, can I just have everybody bow their heads for a moment this morning? And maybe you want to invite Jesus Christ into your heart and see how he might transform your life. If you are interested in that, I just want to pray a quick prayer and just pray this prayer under your breath, not out loud. Just pray this prayer after me. Dear God, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life and to be the master and Lord of my life right now. Lord, I turn away from all my sin and I ask you to to be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long, long time, tell someone, let them know. So this morning, I want to invite the uh, ushers to come up, and we're going to receive the, uh, the communion. And if you're a Christian, I encourage you to receive communion. If you're not, to just let it pass you by. And um, as Christians, we need to examine ourselves, the Bible says. So um, 
during this next song, why don't you just take a few moments and say to God, God, is there anything in me that I need to confess? So just take that time for a few moments as I serve the communion out.